Interestingly, I'm going to be touching on what Ini shared later on in my teaching today. But let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by this faith, the elders obtained a good report. I remember that was the first uh, communication of what faith is really about. It's about a good report and not a good life. I, I remember emphasizing on that in that particular teaching a few weeks ago. So it is by faith the elders obtained not a good life, but a good report. So if your idea of faith is to use it to obtain a good life, you are not using the right tool for your intention. Use any other thing. Go and look for motivational speaking. Go somewhere else. Find a way to make money. And then you would obtain a good life by your means. But if you are using the faith of the Son of God, um, its objective, its, its purpose is not to give you a good life. It is to obtain a good report. And every report has someone it is reporting to. And it is drafted by another. And so your life is that report. But it is God that assesses that report. And it is God that will assess it as good or not. And so we must understand that our faith is designed to do the will of God and not our own will or our own goals or our own ambitions. Verse 4 then says that through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made out of the things that did appear. That means what faith can also help you to do is to raise you above the realities of the mundane world. That means when you're, obta- when you're walking by faith, that which is visible is subject to the power of faith. Anything you can see is subject to change. Anything you can see. And so you should never be intimidated by the things you can see. The fact that you can see it tells you it is changeable. The fact that you can see it tells you it is flexible. Because everything we can see today was made out of the things that did not appear. The Word of God spoke a lot of these things into being, into existence. Without the Word of God, none of the things that we see could be visible or even manifest in the first place. And so anyone who has a handle on faith has a handle on life. Because by faith we understand that the world is framed by the Word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made made out of the things that did appear. And whosoever is born of God, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. And like I shared in that first installment about faith for a good report and not for a good life, I shared about how that it is important that we realize that across the entire landscape of Hebrews chapter 11, we see patriarchs and matriarchs in the Old Testament, and we see that all their outcomes were very divergent. It was very different. So if you plotted their realities across a graph, you are going to see a very scattered diagram. One is using his faith to die. Another one is using his faith to live. One is using his faith for children. Another one is using his faith not to have children so he can bring Jesus into reality. You know, all kinds of outcomes. And so if you attach your faith to an outcome, you will misread the readings of your faith. You will assume that because you're having a good outcome, then faith was working. Not necessarily. Moses struck the rock twice instead of speaking to the rock, and he lost his entrance into the promised land. Now, did the water come out? Yes, it came out. So somebody who would have spoken and another person who would have struck would have gotten exactly the same outcome, the exact same result. But God will judge one and then accept the other because our faith is not outcome dependent. Our faith is not outcome based. So the moment you begin to judge the effectiveness of your faith by its outcome, you are already building the foundation of your faith work on a very shaky foundation, on a shaky ground. The fact that you got that car does not mean it was faith that delivered it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so we must be aware of outcome-based, all right, Christian theology, that it is all about what we are able to gain. Because the Bible says that there will come a time that there will be a penetration into the church about a doctrine that emphasizes gain as godliness. That makes it look like the moment you have, then God is with you. God is on your side. Outcome-based Christianity. And by the time you see the first patriarch that the Bible uses as example of who was able to get something done by faith, the first person we see is Abel, who actually got killed because he walked by faith. Did you hear what I just said? The fact that, see, if he had...
had not walked by faith, he would have lived longer. If he had not offered that offering unto God and had a reference point for his brother, he would not have been killed. He was killed out of the jealousy that his brother had because of his acceptance before God. That means if he had not given that offering by faith, he would have stayed alive. And so we see a man who walked by faith, literally into, into death. <laughs> and he was the first man that was referenced in Hebrews chapter 11. So the moment you begin to use your faith on a more or less a, a manipulative tool, you want something, you want to now use it to get it. You're already on the wrong track. So it is not a need that makes you walk by faith. It is not, I want something, so let me go and dust my faith from where I dropped it, and let me use my faith to get what I want. See, faith is designed to satisfy the needs of God, not your needs. God want to, wants you to have faith so that he can use you to achieve his own objective and his own plan and his own purpose, not yours. And so as long as Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice that was accepted before God and he had the, the testimony that he pleased God, then his faith was active. Even though what, what went after that was the fact that his brother got jealous and got him killed. Now, is it God's will for you to be killed? No, by no means. But that is just a statement to refute all the arguments that may insist on the fact that the positive outcome of your life is the proof that you walked by faith. No, no, no. Because if God shows you the back end, it will be the first on the canon. By, by faith, a bell. He offered, as he finished offering like this, the next thing is death. Because he offered, he would have been better off. But who, who, who is the judge of better off? Who is the judge? Who is the judge of, he would have been better off because he's alive? <laughs> And this is why, like I say, if your life is not being used or deployed for the purpose of the kingdom, you are not better off than someone who may have passed but lived every day of his life in service of a higher cause called the kingdom of God. The purpose of faith is not to get our needs met. The purpose of faith is to please God. And so we must be aware of outcome-based theology around faith. I use my faith for a jet. I use my faith for a car. I use my faith. That is not the primary objective of your faith. Those things will most likely come to the degree of the assignment God gave to you. God is not a waste of resources. Even the fish and the bread that were crumbs. He said, pack everything so that nothing is wasted. Maybe he would have packed it to some other place where those would probably be the raw materials for a herd of swine or for some, you know, farm or something that, that can be useful for them. So it was waste at a level, it can be a raw material at another level. That's literally what they call circular economy. Where you are literally using a waste in a particular space as the raw material for, you know, another industry. So it was a waste. He, he was not saying that so that people will come and eat it. It's so that whatever you consider waste will not be waste in the general analysis. So if God will not waste bread, bread, crumbs. Is it just so I can show that he's big, he'll just give you something you don't need? And what is need? Need is attached to purpose. Need is attached to purpose. Not attached to your desires. Not attached to your whims. So if, if God blesses a man with a thing because he needs it, and you're not beginning to desire that thing that he was blessed with, you that don't need it, and you're now saying because you didn't get it with your faith, your faith was not working. You're just confusing yourself on the faith lane. Plug your faith to the heart of God, not to your needs. Your faith must be plugged to the heart of God. What does God want from my life? And so we must be very careful of outcome-based Christianity. Because if Abel had not given to God by faith and had not been accepted by God, Cain would have had no issues with Abel. And Cain would have left Abel all alone. His problem started when he started pleasing God. And that problem that started is what somebody will look at and say, this guy is out of the will of God. But that same problem was evidence that he pleased God. <laughs> the very first man mentioned in Hebrews 11, he, he does not get more hall of fame than this. This, when you are talking about people that walked by faith, this is the this is the corridor where their pictures are hung. And the first man there is Abel. 
And by the law of first mention, we know that the, what characterizes his faith work is a good indicator of the profile of what faith should be characterized by. This is the first man in Hebrews 11 that was mentioned. And the exact reason why he died was because he walked by faith. You see, some of the things I'm saying here, you may not have heard them before, but it is the word of God I'm sharing with you. And that's why we must plug our faith to the heart of God. Now, the next thing I would like to mention also is that it was not necessarily God's will for aid Abel to have died. It is not God's will. My will for you is that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers, third John verse 2. And so we know that it is not God's desire for Abel to have been cut short in life. With long life, the Bible says, I will satisfy you and I will show you my salvation. Why do you think it was practically impossible for him to have been saved by God, even though it was God's will for him to have been saved? You see, because at the time, there were only four authorized human beings on the face of the earth. There were other people, all right, there may have been Nephilims who were deported from heaven. They came down on earth, started having, we don't even know the realities because it was not clearly stated in scripture, but there are all kinds of postulations around the other people that may have been alive because Cain was obviously afraid that some person may kill him. And so who are these people? We do not know. We have no clear perspective on who these other people are. But there were four authorized that God put on the earth, right? And they were Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. Because at that time, um, Eve had only conceived of these two people. Now, of these four people, three of them had gone rogue. Adam and Eve had gone rogue, excommunicated from the garden. Eve, all right, or uh, Cain himself had gone rogue. He had just killed his brother. So... God could not intervene in the life of Abel except through the agency of the people he had authorized to be on earth. You see the limitation of God in invading the earthly space without disciples that are willing to receive instructions from him. That is, if he wants to save a man in Kogi, he needs another man that can hear him in Kogi before he can save that man. He won't just appear and save. He has to walk. See, this is why we pray. Guess what? If there were at least five more other people through which maybe God could have walked, somehow or the other, one person will come and visit Abel the day came plan to kill him. One of them will say, let us go out. The day came plan, that is the day somebody will be farming. I said, what, what are you doing there? That is the day. But there was nobody on the earth. This is the reason why Abel could so conveniently die, even though it was in the will of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it was not like God... See, God is so limited by his own principles. He is. If you don't pray and you have nobody praying for you, you have no intercessory cover around you, there is a limitation to how much God can do through those people in your life. And so at that time, it was so convenient for Cain to kill Abel because there was no other person available to God to use to avert that evil desire that Cain had. And so, again, like I said, this is not to establish that God's desire is for you to die. No, there are other parts of Scripture that makes it extremely clear that it is not God's will for you to die. With long life, he wants to satisfy. And satisfaction is dependent on the receiver, not the giver. Amen. If you come to my house and I'm giving you rice, and you, I will ask you, is that okay? I'm not going to say, except I'm micing my portions. All right? I'm going to say, whether you, want, you are, whether you are satisfied or not, is your business. Well, yeah. Take you, take this one and go and, and go and eat. But if I really want to satisfy you, I will make what I'm serving you dependent on your understanding of what is enough. So when the Bible says with long life, he will satisfy, there is, a, there is the component that is required that is, God wants you to be a major part of that engagement. So you can live for as long as you want to live, as long as you are living to satisfy his will. Because if you, if, you are not willing, if you are not living to satisfy the will of him that has put you on this side of the divide, what return does he have on keeping you alive? And this is why you see sometimes they will say they are, you know, they are parts of scripture that negate themselves. No. If you understand it from the perspective of him that holds these principles in tandem and in balance, you will not see those principles as antagonizing themselves. 
you will see that there is something called the will of God. And the Bible says he orders everything according to the counsel of his own will. So when the Bible says, I will not die but live, to declare the works of the Lord in the land of the living. If you are walking in line with declaring the works of the Lord in the land of the living, the devil cannot just come and hijack that life. Because you are working and serving a cause that is bigger than both you and the devil that is trying to come to steal your life. Praise the name of the Lord. But the most important thing is to align your life with the will of God. With the will of God. Are we still together? Amen. And so we must be very, we must be very aware of how powerful man can be on this side of the divide. You know, John Wesley said, it seems like God will do nothing except men pray. It just seems like God will just stand. He moved when somebody prayed. <laughs> somebody prayed again, he moved. <laughs> okay. So it's looking like God is almost dependent on people's prayers and people's movements. What if Eve was still connected to God and was praying for her son? What if the, there was nobody that could save Abel? There was no way God could have used another human agent to get salvation across to Abel. And so we must understand the power of man so that we stop blaming God because the devil and God receive too much blame for the things they are really not responsible for. Man is far more powerful. You see, what I can describe the devil, or let me use this word light and darkness. What the best way I can describe light and darkness are lobbyists. They are lobbyists. They never sit on the throne of the earth, but they are lobbyists. Now, when the lobbyist called darkness lobbies the person sitting on the throne of the earth, you see, the person sitting on that throne will now carry out the agenda of the lobbyist that was able to influence him to do that which he wanted. When the throne is also lobbied by the spirit, and then the person sitting on the, on the throne allows the spirit of God influence him, that person will now carry out an agenda that is consistent to the plan of God. It does not mean it was God or the darkness that did those things. They were lobbyists. It is man that carries out the desires of whichever lobbyist he chooses to align with. This is why we pray. So that we can constantly allow the agenda of God use us to achieve its goal and objective. Because if you are not praying, you are already submitting to this one. I shared this some time ago during one of the Bible studies. That the way the world is designed, good must be pursued. Evil does not have to be pursued. I'll say that again. Order, good, a higher call must be pursued. But evil, degeneracy, corruption, atrophy, they don't have to be pursued. Just stop pursuing good. You are already submitting to atrophy. You decide to wash your plate. You decide to arrange your room. You decide to lay your bed. You don't have to decide to scatter it. You don't have to decide. It happens as a function of you not choosing to arrange it. So you not aligning with God already submits you to the whims and caprices of the devil. This is why they say that if you're walking on the path and you're not feeling resistance, most likely you're on the same path with the devil. You are moving in the direction. Everything is just easy. It's just, <laughs> just flowing. Look to your right and to your left. Most likely, if the devil winds down, <laughs> you will see that you are on the same path. Because if you choose righteousness, one thing is promised, resistance. So you don't have to choose the devil. You don't have to choose... <laughs> that will cause him the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. They only need to not obey. They are already been influenced by the spirit of disobedience because they did not obey. They didn't submit to the spirit of Christ and they already submitted. There are no neutral grounds. There are no neutral grounds. So when you are walking in jealousy, walking in envy, you have already submitted your vessel. Do you think that Cain and the devil had a meeting? Where Cain met the person that was responsible for the excommunication of his parents from the garden? Do you really think there was an official meeting like that? He just allowed jealousy come in. 
And the murder was the product, product of that allowance. Murder. <laughs> if you had asked him, this was the guy that by himself, or oh, do you know, if we look at the, the narrative properly, we should give more credit to Cain. Because Cain was the one that started this whole offering thing. Where did he get it from? Maybe Adam and Eve had not offered to God in God knows how many years. They, had left, they probably had a beef with God. Somehow or the other, this Cain looked up and said, there must be a God somewhere. Let me offer unto him. And Bible says, Abel also. So he didn't start it with Abel. Abel copied Cain. Yet, it was the person that copied me. That had a... Uh, has that happened to you before? You opened the book. The person is copying you. You had F, the person had A, and you are wondering, something is wrong with this examiner. Because how can the me supplying you the... You are not... That was, so you can understand that Cain felt that way because... Why now? Why, why, why? Like, why? Moreover, also... You must have been familiar with the weaknesses of Abel. You must have been familiar with the realities of the fact that Abel is not that good. Abel is not even better than me. I'm older than him. I'm neater than him. I'm more responsible than him. This guy snores. This guy is just everything that I'm not. He, he was so acquainted with Abel that he couldn't understand. He couldn't rationalize why God would accept Abel over and above him. Then he got offended at both God and Abel. And he carried out that evil desire by killing, by killing Abel. But let's not run ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. So first, we have learned about how that we must beware of outcome-based Christianity. We've also learned a thing or two about believers' authority, how that God could not route deliverance in the way of Abel because he had nobody to work with. There were only four authorized personnel upon the face of the earth, and three of them had gone rogue. The only person that was still in line with pleasing God had been killed. All right, so there was no way. God, God was literally limited. The best he could do was to use the conscience of Cain to ask him, what have you done to your brother? But he couldn't get salvation down to Abel in time because there was nobody that could help. This is what happens when we pray. When we pray and there are vessels like Ananias in places, all right, in, in cities, in towns, in streets, God can use those people to bring salvation to a person. Because somebody prayed from somewhere, then it was the nearest possible disciple that could then deliver it as logistics. Because the prayer in itself is also not sufficient. God will now have a way of informing a human vessel. Because God is not authorized except the man authorizes him. The earth is the Lord's, but the man holds the key. The same way your house is yours, but wait, your house belongs to the landlord, but you hold the key. Your landlord cannot just trespass. It is actually trespass. If he comes into your house unannounced, uninformed, and he just shows up, it is, it, you can sue him. He owns the bricks and the mortar. He paid for it, but he can't just enter into your house however he wants, whenever he wants, because you hold the key. It's the exact same way. The earth is the Lord's, as in terms of ownership, but man possesses its function. Man possesses it for its daily activities. So if God must show up on the face of the earth, a man must have let him in. And if the devil is acting wild around the earth, a man let him in. A man. At the end of the day, the man sits on the throne. Darkness and light are only lobbyists. And so when the devil got the key from Adam, remember by the time he was going to narrate the same thing to Jesus, trying to tempt him, he said, it has been what? Delivered unto me. He didn't collect it illegally. It was given to him by a man. And that is why only a man could collect the keys of hell and death. So God had to become a man. He couldn't collect it as God. It would be cheating. He himself will know that that will not align with the protocols that sustain the governance of the earth. So he had to become a man. And for him to become a man, the word of God had to become flesh. So several aeons had gone. Prophets were speaking into the atmosphere for several thousands of years. And in the fullness of time, those words, they combined, they crystallized, and they became flesh. And that flesh was the man Jesus Christ. Bible says there is a mediator between God and man. He didn't say the angel. He didn't say the spirit being. He said the man. Even in heaven, Jesus has maintained his... 
What's the word? What's, what's the man? What's the word? You get what I'm saying? He has maintained his humanity. For a better, that's a better word, right? He has maintained his humanity forever. So when you get to heaven, you won't see a spirit Jesus. You will see a man. The Bible calls him the man. There is a mediator between God and man. He's a man. And that's the only capacity with which he was able to gain that authority back from the enemy. And so we see those things play out in the story of Abel. Just that small story of Abel, we can see these two realities. That our faith work is not outcome based. Did we please God? That's the best outcome. It is not based on what you assess as a good or positive outcome or a negative outcome. Because even though he died because he pleased God, he pleased God. He pleased God and it was recorded in Hebrews 11 as a patriarch of faith that indeed he pleased God. So by faith, verse 4, Abel offered glory to God. Abel offered unto God. The fact that Abel can offer unto God is such a privilege. Do you know who God is? Do you know how huge he is? The Bible says by faith, you also can offer. You can come before God with an offering. The Bible says by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Now, I don't think it's because he looked at Cain, improved on his sacrifice, and gave to God. I don't think so. All right? God is the one that judged that he was more excellent. It was not him that judged. Because you can never judge right. You bring 20K, someone brings 200K. You think 200K is bigger than 20K. You are wrong. Because Jesus sat at the treasury, he saw a woman bring a last night, and there were people bringing all kinds, and Jesus said, this woman has given more. We are incapable of judging who gives more amongst ourselves. And that is why the Bible says it's unwise, because it will never bring about an accurate conclusion. It is unwise. How do you want to come up with an assessment that is accurate? You don't have all the perspectives before you. And that is why comparison is a very foolish endeavor. You have no idea the distance between you and that person relative to God. You have no idea what God is doing in the life of that person. You have no idea the instructions God gave that person. You have no idea. Why are you getting so worked up about the things happening in another person's life when you have your work with God to focus on? Bible says he gave a more, and that is from God's perspective. From God's perspective, he gave a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By which Bible says he obtained a witness. That he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaks. The title of my teaching this morning is By Faith, Abel. Then you put an I thing or a high thing, and then you write the eternalization agenda of faith. The eternalization agenda of faith. By faith, Abel. The eternalization agenda of faith. God is telling us quite clearly here that someone can be dead yet speaks. That someone could have lived a certain time, died at another certain time, but never stopped living. He said... He gave something. He gave some specific things called gifts. And on the strength of those gifts that he gave, he got a witness that he pleased God and that he was righteous. And the Bible says, even though he was dead, he speaks. And so we're going to be examining what it means to live a life that having lived, you can't die again. Because you lived and you lived according to a certain tenet. Even when the devil takes your life, you are still living. I remember seeing a patriarch of the faith of our generation a month after he died. He died November 9. I saw him in December, that, in my dream, of course. Now, we, we must be very careful when we talk about things like this because it's important that we realize that those experiences do not confirm scripture. Did you hear what I said? So you don't talk about Oh, you are fraternizing with a dead person, and then it is from that dead person you are receiving instructions. <laughs> that may be a familiar spirit. But to the degree that this scripture that I just shared with you confirms that experience, it is to that degree that I'm sharing that experience. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the word of God stands as the arbiter of truth and not our experiences. Okay? So I saw that man, and he said only one phrase to me. He said, I'm alive. 
and he, he walked away. He was dressed the exact same way he dressed in the particular book of his that I'd read. He was dressed exactly that way. He shook my hands and he said, he mentioned my name and he said, I'm alive. And he moved. Of course, he's dead. But he said that with such authority that he knew exactly what he meant. And by what I'm just reading now, I know exactly what he meant. That even though he was dead, yet he speaks. Are there no men among us who are long dead but are still speaking? When you hear people of the ilk of Reverend Kenneth Hagin, brother Kenneth Hagin, Pastor Kenneth Hagin, whichever one you want to call him, because <laughs> that man, even though he's been dead for quite a while, over two decades now, he's still speaking. And there are people who are living and not speaking. Yet, someone who is dead is still speaking. <laughs> what kind of life should you live such that even death cannot kill you? You will continue to speak. That was the kind of faith that Abel introduced to the church. The kind of faith that does not stop from propagating. Even though you killed the man, the gifts of the man continue to speak. What kind of a life is so eternalized? <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. So the Bible says, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous and God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. Now, the first sacred cow we have to, even though there's a pawn somewhere in that sacred cow, because one of the things that is shared, especially regarding this particular story of Abel and Cain, was that he didn't give things that had blood. So it is really pun intended. When you say there's a sacred cow you have to kill, in explaining the fact that Abel did not kill a cow. <laughs> because people say that Cain, all right, gave... Um, you know, gave fruits. And Abel gave cattle, killed a cow, pretty much. And then he offered something that was bloody to God. So that was why God accepted, because God is a cannibal, you know. He, he likes blood, he's a vampire. So he, if you give him blood like this, he will just come to you and accept you. But if you give him fruit, he is not a vegetarian. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't like vegetables. Sometimes I'm like, how do we come up with these revelations? I said, there's blood in this one. There's blood. Give me blood. See, the first job eh, that God ever gave any man was the job of a farmer. So if there was even a job that he expects human beings to have, it's the farming because that was the first instruction he gave to Adam. That till this ground, keep it. You understand? So keep the ground. Praise God. So if Cain was a farmer and... Um, Abel was a keeper of sheep. That definitely was not the basis upon which one of them, or both of them were, or one of them was accepted and the other one rejected. That was clearly not the basis. So God will never judge you based on what you don't have. So for, for, for Cain to have given a bloody animal, he would have had to steal it. What kind of a God expects you to steal so that he can be pleased? It was out of what they had. That they gave. There was nothing wrong with that. God had no problem with the nature, the profile, the He doesn't have a problem with the gifts, which is why it has never been about the things you are giving. See, when it comes to God, it has never been about the things you are giving. Because He does not collect those things you gave. If you check it, those things you gave, they are still on the earth. They didn't rise. Say so he accepted and the things that are floating to him. No, they didn't rise to him. There is something he's looking for in that which you gave. It is the honor in your heart that rises to him as a sacrifice. The thing you give stays here, but you can eternalize that thing you give by, con by ensuring that you give it the right way to God. So, it was not about the fact that Cain gave fruits and vegetables, and then Abel gave cattle and sheep, and then so God collected the one that had blood. No. There was something more present. Let's go to Genesis 4, because that's where the narrative is lodged. Genesis 4. Amen. Amen. See what faith is for? Faith is for eternalizing your life. <laughs> when you see the real work of faith, you will, not, you will not relegate it to just meeting your needs. There are bigger things. There are bigger things. Genesis chapter 4. Now be comparing your own results with somebody else's results and say, that person walked by faith. This one did not walk by faith. How dare you? Who are you to judge the outcome of a man's faith? 
And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she bare again his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought out of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. That's the end. We see the kind of thing he gave to God. It, it was, there was a way he did it. Because by the way we, the, the Abel's offering was described, we can tell that there was a bit more attention paid to the offering and the giving of Abel than the giving of Cain. Bible says, but Abel, he also, he copied Cain. But there was something he did extra that Cain did not do. And Abel also brought off the first links of his flock. Look at the next qualification. And of the fat thereof. That is, he looked at his sheep. He looked at his cattle. He brought the very best. He didn't just bring, look at what Cain did. He brought off the fruit of the ground, an offering. There was no qualification of the kind of offering. Now, like I said, it is not the type but the kind. It is not the type in terms of fruit cattle, but what kind? And it is your heart that gives the kind to the fruit. Not the type. It is the kind. What comes from your heart? And you will see. Bible says that Abel brought out of the first links of his flock and of the fat thereof. They qualify Because if Cain's own desert qualification, it would have been qualified. If they, they could have just said, and he also brought of the first links of his, of, of his flock. First links already tells you it is the strongest. Then there was an extra qualification of it that it was of the fat thereof. That is the very best of his flock was given unto God. And Bible says, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offerings. So you see that when Hebrews was talking about it, there is an assumption that it is only the gift God respected. Hebrews 11 says, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, he being dead, yet speaks. But by the time you read Genesis 4, you realize that the first thing God accepted was Abel, before his gifts. So it is the acceptance of the person that, all right, extends to his gifts. It is the acceptance of the person. So the first gift Abel gave God was not his cattle. The first gift he gave God was himself. This is why it does not matter how rich you ever become. If you have not given your life to God, bring two billion. Eh? We will maybe collect it to do good works. But God did not accept you or your offering. And if we are familiar with God's rejection, we would also reject it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If we are acquainted with the fact that God says don't collect that, it doesn't matter how rich. Because it is the person God accepts that confers acceptance on the gift they bring. So there was a particular posture that Cain had occupied in the grand scheme of things that God rejected. It was not the gift that he rejected. It was the person of Cain. It was not the gift of Abel that he accepted. It was the person of Abel, even though his person reflected in his gifts. His person reflected. So the tithe you give is not just a flimsy, casual 10%. It's the first 10%. There's a world of difference. Someone comes and says, I beg, urgent 2K. Ah, they just paid my salary. Even though I have it, I can't give you first. Give me some time. I'm not giving my tithe. The first 10, the first links, and then the fat thereof, the best of the lot, the best energy, the best strength, the most precious. That's the one that God deserves. Not just anything. So the fact that it's church, people just relegate the quality of the gift. So it's church, uh, it's church, uh, church will collect anything now. Back then, growing up, ha, ah, ushers had work to do. <laughs> you will see the way they will run through the notes. You will be embarrassed for the note. Because it's almost like they are, they are ashamed for people to see what they are giving God. So they have to squeeze it in such a way that if they open their hand, you will still not see it. <laughs> because they've squeezed the life out of it. Then they will not chuck it inside the envelope. And then five minutes, we're supposed to be done counting the money. We're still counting two hours later. Because we first have to stretch it. Or maybe even iron it before we can then count it. Because of how rumpled it is. And this is what you are giving God. Imagine you carried rumpled money to your father. 
Say, take. Even though we use it for vibes these days. Say, if you see my husband, squeeze, squeeze $2,000. So, <laughs> I'm looking in the direction. <laughs> All right? Just squeeze it into his hand. So, you know, there is that feeling that, see, it does not matter how you squeeze, whether you squeeze it or you stretch it, is it $5,000? Is it $2,000? That's the most important thing. And you know, motivational speakers also took us to another level. Put two narrow notes on the ground. One is squeezed, one is nice. Which one is better? It does not matter whether you are squeezed or not. And all kinds of revelation came out of that. <laughs> that was a really nice illustration, by the way. But you see, those things sort of dulled us from understanding the place of attitude and the place of honor. That does not matter how anything is presented. What matters is that it's presented. No. What goes to God is the honor, not the money. It's the honor. So there was a way Abel paid a lot of attention. He was about to give of his flock. He looked at everything. He looked at everything. Which one is the best? Firstlings. Which one is the fattest firstling? And then he took it. And then he gave it to God with a sense of honor. The one that didn't give it with honor. We now see why God rejected him after he was rejected. Sometimes God is waiting on your reaction to validate his own position. He rejected you for a reason. You are now showing exactly why he rejected you. You have since God blessed someone <laughs> and you are now reacting because somebody, hey, why do you think eliminating him makes you accepted? Does that improve your condition? Learn and grow. But you say, I will kill him. Let there be no comparative. There will be no form of reference. So that the only one you have is the bad that, that exists. So you have to collect it like that. There is no able to give you good sacrifice again. I'm the only one alive. So is that you continue to collect from maybe the Adam and Eve or the next generation. And Bami Bumoyeri, there's no, there's no. Because he, he will not improve the quality of his giving. He will rather eliminate the other alternative. And that's, that shows why God rejected him. Because he gave God for status. He didn't give God for God. He gave God for status. It was not so much about God. Because if it was about God, then if he rejected you, you go and ask him. God, I, I see that you rejected me and I am aware that you rejected me. Because for some reason, they were aware of the acceptance and rejection. It was like letter. You know, God sent them an email. You have been accepted into the college. Or it was that blue letter they used to give people at visa office. That thing is not a nice thing. Ah, you don't want to see that blue letter. And there's plenty English inside. You can just say you have been rejected. There's no need to give me all this. So they sort of knew that they had been, one of them was accepted, the other one was rejected, and he acted based on that feedback. And he, he was rejected. Instead of him to come and ask God, how can I improve my gift? I'm still alive. I can give again. I still have crops in the ground. There's harvest the next year. I will give again. Let me just give me something I can work with. Like I said this morning, if you are not good with feedback, you are, you are literally living a stunted life. You are not growing. You are not helping yourself. Because there is no account of Cain again. He just went like a vagabond and that's the end. There, there's, no, there's no posterity. Even though he cut Abel's life short, Abel is still featuring in Hebrews 11. Where is he featuring? So he didn't receive feedback and he cut his own life short even though he was alive. Yet, he was no longer speaking. But there was an Abel that he killed that was still speaking long after he was dead. Long after he was dead. Because Abel gave a certain kind of offering. What kind of offering do you give? What kind? You don't just give God anything. God is not your mate. You don't just squeeze anything and dump it at his... No! He is God all by himself. He does not need you to survive. Yet, he has given you all things richly to enjoy. And it's not demanding that you give him back. But if you must give him, you had better investigate. You had better understand the protocols that govern entering into his presence and the kind of gifts he respects. The Bible said he had respect. That is, if you give him anything that looks like him, he will respect it. He respects himself. You give him things consistent with his profile as God, he respects it. And he elevates you to the level of what he respects. He will accept you in the line of how you saw him. If you are going to give a king, you had better give a kingly gift. Praise God. And so this is God telling Cain and Abel, 
I accept Abel, I reject Cain, and Cain got offended. Have you ever been offended when people give you negative feedback? And you're upset and you begin to throw all kind of tantrums, almost like you assume you're perfect. Wait, you didn't want any feedback. That's because you're assuming you're perfect. And that is the kind of prayer that goes before a fall because you will go into territories that grace does not cover you. Because you'll be assuming that you are perfect in all your ways. And that was exactly the kind of attitude that Lucifer began to uh, you know, fraternize with. And that, that was how he got evicted from heaven. Because he assumed that he was perfect in all his ways. So God was giving him feedback. This attitude, this attitude, change, change. Before you know what was going on, he started talking to everybody in heaven, all the angels that connived with him. All of them went down. And God didn't lift a finger. It was, angel, it was Michael that did all that work. God is too big. When you are coming to his presence, you had better understand the magnitude of the God you are coming to see. Cain could not receive feedback. You were rejected. How about you change your ways? What can I do? Maybe you should have asked Abel himself, what did you do? So I have been thinking about this thing for the past six months. You know, this message was very difficult to preach, to be honest. And the reason is because tomorrow is my birthday. No, no, no. No, no, no. The reason, and... At some point, I looked at it. I said, shit, people will not start thinking, to be honest. But it just so happened that that is the first. I'm just telling you disclaimer. Now, the reason why man cannot be as picky as God, so let me balance it, eh, please. The reason why man cannot be as picky as God is because man cannot see the way God sees. God saw from that woman's gift that it was all she had. And God accepted a might as everything. So God is not impressed by the magnitude of what you have given. If the heart shows that you prioritize God, he accepts it. Man cannot see that big picture. And so what man can do is to believe people's best. So you bring any gift, it is accepted. Pencil, eraser, it is accepted. Do you understand what I'm saying? And man is not God too. Do you understand that? The Lord will give you understanding. I just needed to share that so that um, I can preach freely. (laughs) Praise God. And so Cain could not receive that feedback from, from God, and he would not allow Abel, his younger brother, teach him on how to give gifts. Where were you when I started thinking of giving the gift in the first place? He's now you don't want to educate me on how to give a good gift. So you, 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 you can feel Cain's pain. I taught you how to give gifts. You are now, you are now telling me how to be accepted by the God that I gave first. So he was not going to have it, but then you'd also see the pride and arrogance in his heart. Bible says, let's go to um, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Ah, we still have a long way to go. God help us this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. See, yeah, after this teaching, the way you will serve God will be different. That is one of the things God has communicated in my heart regarding this teaching. That the way people will serve God will be different. You don't give God craps again, or scraps. You don't, you don't just give him your, your worst energy. You read your Bible when you're exhausted, finished. No, you give him your best. You meditate when you're freshest. All right? You pray when you, when, you, when you have vigor. Even when you don't, you know that there's priority on prayer, and that prayer can even give you the strength you need. My point is, you are not giving God your least energy, your least resource, your least energy, and all that. First Samuel chapter 2, Bible says something very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. Ah, that thing is powerful. First Samuel chapter 2. First Samuel is after first. Amen. First Samuel is. Okay, you found it, right? First Samuel chapter 2. Bible says from verse 3. Let's we'll start from verse 2. This is Anna praying, right? Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord, my horn. Is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. So Anna gave us a song in the body of Christ. That's a very powerful song right there. All right? That's a song, you know. Verse 3 then says, Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogance. Because when you are in the presence of God, banish pride. Banish arrogance. Don't speak more highly than you ought. You are in the presence of a holy God. He says, there is none beside thee. There is no rock like you. 
Talk no more exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogance come out of your mouth. You know why? Because by the Lord, actions are weighed. The Bible says he's the God of knowledge. God knows the weight of that two billion naira seed you are giving to the church. And he knows it doesn't worth anything. Two billion naira, yes, two men. But I can see the real weight of that gift. And there is a woman who may not have had a job for the past six months. But this six months of not having a job, she's coming to church every Saturday. She's cleaning. She's loving the Lord. She's giving her best. She's there every moment. She's giving far more. Even though you can't count the money she's giving in, money, in naira and dollars, but she's there. Her heart is showing that I love you, Lord. If I had more, I would have given more. And while I don't have, I'm giving myself. And there's one that comes with 2,000, uh, you know, in Stafford Church, you know, he's not really available. He's in meetings, he's boardrooms, you know. He has all kinds of engagements. But what does the church need? What does the church need? I'll send a check. I'll send a check. And the Bible says he's the God of knowledge, and by him, actions. Wow. What is the weight of all your actions? By God, actions. Everything we see that looks so impressive, it is weighed on a balance. I hope you know. God will put all your actions on a, way, on, a, on a weighing scale and he will see the outcome of that action. And there's another person whose action does not look like much, but he weighs so much. We will be shocked in heaven. You will think God would you know, categorize heaven by general overseer, pastor, director, members. There's no such dichotomy in heaven. You will be shocked where some general overseers will line up. You'll be shocked. Because it is not about what we call massive activities, big actions. It is by God actions are weighed. If we understood this, we will serve God humbly in our lane, not looking for vain glory, not looking for somebody to recognize us or appreciate us on a grand scale or get offended when somebody does not call us. Who were you serving in the first place? Who were you giving that service to? So you were sick, you didn't come to church for two weeks, nobody called you, and you are offended at the whole body of Christ. Say, church, I don't do church again. Wow. Who are you serving in the first place? By God, actions are weighed. We now know that Cain gave so that he could be rewarded. Because when he was not rewarded with acceptance, he got offended. So you were giving so that they would award you a certain award. Now that they do not give you, you're like, I'm out of this church. They don't, they, let me go to where I'm celebrated. So you leave where you are serving and you want to go to where you are celebrated. May you not be celebrated by flatterers. May you not be celebrated by flatterers. Amen. Amen. Cain should have just humbly received feedback. Instead, he became so high-minded. Like, God was so patient with him. Imagine. God even put a mark on him so that nobody would kill him. God didn't need what he gave. God even wanted him to stay alive. God loves everyone, but he is also an objective God. If you bring something that is not consistent with him, he will give you that feedback and he will let you know so that you can grow and get better. The problem has never been God's disposition. It's the quality of your heart. Look at the prodigal son and his other prodigal brother. Because there, were not just one, there was not just one prodigal son in Luke 15. There were two of them. One of them ran out of the house, came back, and had a repentant heart. The other guy stayed in the house and never repented. The one that stayed in the house looked, see, he would have been fine had his brother not, not come back. He would have been okay had he not seen how his father threw a party for his brother that had been lost and is now back. He would have been okay had he not seen the blessing on another person. You may have been serving God consistently had you not found out that somebody got married before you that you were more spiritual than on campus. You were okay until you compared. You were fine. You were working in, the, in, in, in your father's vineyard. You were serving with all your heart until you saw the blessing on another person. And you started saying, God is not fair. No, God has been fair all along. It is your heart that is corrupted. God does not owe you any explanation. And even that God came out and he said, join your brother. He said, ah, I've been working with you all these years. You have not even killed a kid. Is that the mindset you have? Everything I have is yours. As a matter of fact, it's from your own I'm giving him now. All I had has always been yours. What kind of a mindset do you have? God's disposition did not change. It was your heart that made him look bad. So it was never really about the fact that God preferred David to Saul. Saul messed up repeatedly. 
And Samuel looked at him and said, God now would have established your kingdom forever. But for the things you have done, you know what? He has given it to someone better than you. And in Saul's mind, maybe it was God that didn't just like it. No, if you do well. Is that what the Bible says in Genesis, 1, Genesis 4? Let's go back there to Genesis 4. Genesis 4, let's, let's just go back there. Because we need to learn how to offer gifts unto God. God does not just accept anything. And the Lord said unto Cain, look at it, verse 4. And Abel also brought of the firstlings of the flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel, and unto his offering. And unto Cain, and unto his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very rough and angry, and his countenance fell. So he gave so that he could be recognized as the giver. The one that gives. The one that is sustaining the church. The one that if, if he does not give, the kingdom will collapse. So God did not recognize, that, recognize him in that way. And then he was offended. He was angry. And instead of him to receive correction and comfort from the presence of God, he decided, you know what, I'm going to eliminate the other alternative that could have made God happy. I'm going to offend God, and I'm going to kill this guy that he seems to be pleased with. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou rot? And why is your countenance falling? So they correct you. You get a negative feedback, and you are carrying swollen face all around. Somebody gave you a feedback, and you are swollen. You are, you are not happy. Why? Somebody just gave you a lifesaver. Somebody just corrected you. Somebody just had mercy on you. They could have left you going in your way, and you would have died of destruction. Now they've given you a feedback to turn from your evil path and you are offended. You are, you are forsaking all right, your salvation and following after lying vanities. Someone is saving you. You are angry at the person that is saving you. You are looking for what you are celebrated. No, you are corrected. Go to places you can grow. And you can't grow without correction. They celebrate those who have grown to a certain level and are consistently producing a level of results consistent with the God kind. When you get to that level, God knows and he will show you platforms that are consistent with that level of growth. While you are on your way there, put yourself under tutors and governors. Receive correction. Continue to receive correction. There is psychology to every game. The moment a player begins to allow all the praise and adulation he's seen in the newspapers get into his head, he will stop playing well. You'll be wondering, what happened? The same player, nothing changed. But he started agreeing with the things that people are saying about him. He's the best youngster I've ever seen in a long time. Since Lionel Messi, nobody has been like him. And he starts believing it. And get on the pitch with the chip on his shoulder. He's not going to track back, you will not track back. You start believing. You will go 20 games, you will not score a goal. You say, you know what, maybe you should go for a loan. <laughs> youngster! Keep your head on the ground. Continue to ask your coach, how can I improve? What are the areas of my game that I need to change? You will not say, I, I, I'm the new Lionel, Lionel Messi. Let's not go there. <laughs> Let's not go there. You put your head on the ground and you receive feedback. Instead of Cain receiving feedback, he got upset. Even God saw that he was swollen. And the Bible says, the Lord told him, why are you wrath? Why, I, why is your countenance falling? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? God is no respecter of persons. If the quality of your gift passes his scrutiny, you will be accepted. And if thou doest not well, the Bible says, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall his desires, and thou shalt rule over him. <laughs> and he didn't, get the, he didn't get the message. He didn't get the parable. So he went ahead to sin. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, and Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel, thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Wow. And he said, What hast thou, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother, brother's blood cried unto me from the ground, and now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee a strength and, you know, cursed Cain. But the core of our emphasis today is the quality of gift that Cain gave. So yes, I may not be able to tell the quality of your gift from your gift because I don't see your heart because it is the heart that puts quality to the gift for by God actions are weighed. However, the quality of your gift can also all right, be reflected, or the quality of your heart can be reflected in the quality of your gift. Because you can also see the difference between Cain's gift and Abel's gift. 
there was a level of thoughtfulness that went into Abel's gift that did not go into Cain's gift. He just saw some stuff, you know, just gave it to God, you know, just gave it. And for Abel, there was a level of proper understanding of the person that he was going to be giving that gift. Now, there's a group of people also that I would like us to examine. First, Chronicles chapter 29. And it's David and his men. And that's why you also understand that it is the quality of person that determines the quality of the gift. First Chronicles chapter 29. Remember, remember, there was a time that David loved God. He really wanted to build the Lord a house. Remember that story? And then God told him, he said, I can't allow you to build me a house. Why? Because there's too much blood on your hand. Do you know, David could have gotten offended. Just like Cain. He could have gotten offended. That I even thought of giving you a house. You are, you are saying, I can't give you. I don't understand. What are you saying? Is it not a house you are looking for? He could have gotten offended. Yet, you know what he said? He said, okay, can I prepare for it? Can I, can I look for resources to make it happen? He still found the way to be part of the process. Because how can he be angry at God? God has the right to reject and accept whatever he wants. He is sovereign by himself. And so if God says, I accept you, yes, feel great. If he says he rejects you, ask him again, what did I do? Because it is not in me he rejected. It is something that I did. It is an attitude that I have. It is a posture in my heart that is rejecting. How about I seek feedback? And so eventually God accepted and said, okay, you know what? Prepare for it. And this is the story of what happened when David and his men began to give unto the Lord. Wow. Now, let's, let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29 from verse 10. Let's just read it from the screen. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever next. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory. You know, when people give, they eulogize themselves. I've noticed that those who give the greatest believe they gave the least. And those who give the least believe they gave the greatest. If you see what David and his men gave, they should be waxing lyrical about how great givers they are. Yet, they made it all about God. Because really, it is still all about God. You see, when people are offended, what do they say? After all I did. Who did you think you were serving with all you did? You served a God. God never forgets. Church hurt should not make you stop coming to church. After all I did for that church. After all I did. So it was all about you. Not the greatness of the God you were serving. No matter what happens on your line of service, if it was God you served, be glad. Walk away smiling. God tells you to leave, leave. But never feel offended. It was God you served, man. It was God you served. Bible says, and the victory and the glory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and the things that are in the earth are thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou exalted as head above all. Next verse. Both riches and honor. Wow. Everything in your account belongs to God. You are the one borrowing from him to survive. Everything in your account belongs to God already. Yet it is you that you have decided whether to give God or not. Everything already belongs to him. You should be asking how should you spend the one that he has allowed you to, to spend. Yet it is you that is almost negotiating, I will give God fire, I will, give, I will not even give God this month. Bible says, all riches and honor come of thee and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Wow. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Next verse. Who am I? This is the posture of a giver. Not, look at what I've given. Look at what I've done. You see this other guy that does not give enough. <laughs> he, he's, not, he's not to my level. I'm the one that is making you breathe. Who am I? And what is my people? That we should be able. That means offering is a privilege. Look at the posture of heart. He said, who are we? Like, how did you allow for us to be able to say we gave you? That we can give you an offering. And we can say we, we were the ones that gave. Who are we? What are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly? 
Look at everything he was referencing. He was referencing the quality of the giving from the place of the heart, not necessarily the volume in terms of money or dollars. The quality of heart, the cheerfulness, the willingness, the, the, the way, the delight. Those are the things that go to God. The honor, the things that are intangible, the things that no man can spend on earth. Those are the things that go to God. The money stays here, but the honor goes up. And the Bible says that we should be able to offer some willingly after this sort. For all things, glory to God. All things come of thee and of thine own. Wow. Of thine own have we given thee. This energy I'm using to preach is from God. This strength that I'm using to come to church and serving is from God. This skill that I have to be able to design flyers is from God. This ability to sing is from God. Whatever you are able to give, you collected it first. And it was God that gave it to you. What do we have except that which we have received from God? What do you have that you now think, I can choose not to come to church? Who are you? And I'm saying that as respectfully as possible. Please, can you help me ask your neighbor? No. Who are you going to? Like, David said, what am I? What are my people that we should be able to give? If you see what they give, <laughs> they shouldn't be talking like this. Oh. Because when people give like this, the pastor should create a monument for them. Create a special seat in front. And then call them forward and celebrate them, serenade them, bring parana for them, so that they will feel like, eh, hey, we are the ones making the church stand. I says, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay, I don't like public. You don't like public. Then you send the money, you ask, have you, have you seen it? You get the Lord now. Amen. What is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given you. It is just an honor to be able to give unto the Lord. Next verse. For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners, and we are all our fathers. Our days on this earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. Next verse. O oh Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee a house for thine holy name. They've not built it, though. It is just preparing to build it. For thine holy name, cometh of thine hand. He really knew what he was saying. Because he remembered when he was just running from cave to cave. From Adulam to Engedi to Zif, running for his own survival. He knew when he didn't have nothing. When they plundered them of everything they had, their children, their wives, their properties in Ziklag. He knew that everything he's been able to give, it was God that gave it to him. He knew it. He knew it. And sometimes this is why God extends your season of lack. So that it will remain a proper memory in your hard drive. So that when you check the hard drive, there's a significant percentage. Because you can't say you forgot. <laughs> Two years, you can't uh, forget. Ken. Because if you pass through that season, you will forget. So you will stay there. God will humble you there. <laughs> so that some seasons down the line, you can never say it was your power that made you rich. Because you did everything you could in those seasons. Nothing happened. When it was God's time, you opened doors. And you started walking through doors of breakthroughs, from breakthrough to breakthrough. And now you're going from one part of the earth to another. And one day, you look at somebody that is going through what you're going You say, he's lazy. How can you? How dare you? Were you lazy when you were going through that season also? You did everything in your power. It was through that season God taught you that it is not by power. You, it was a scripture to you until you experienced it. Because you did everything power could do. You did everything might could do. It was by the grace of God. So the next time somebody will exalt power over grace, you say, keep quiet. I tried everything my power could try. It didn't bring me breakthrough. When it was God's time to open doors of mercy, he opened it of his own accord. I didn't do anything. You would understand that scripture by experience. That it is not by power, it is not by might. It is by your grace. It is by the spirit of God. The race is not always to the swift. Bread is not always to the wise. Are you still here? Oh, Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee an house for thine holy name, come out of thy hand. And it is all thine own. Why should I be thanking you for what is mine? We expect too much thanksgiving from God. We should be thanking him that we gave. 
Yet we're expecting him to thank us that he, we gave him. I gave you something. You gave me back. You're expecting me to thank you. If we understood, if we had this revelation, why should we be expecting some high horse, high throne, high place, high award, high appreciation? From whether it is the pastor or whatever it is that you are giving the church, you are expecting so much thanksgiving. If you really knew that you were only, you were only holding that resource in trust and you are only giving it back to the person that has always owned it, why are you looking for thanksgiving? It is thanksgiving enough that you were able to give to him. Wow. Next verse. I know also, my God, I doubt... I... Thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly... I, this is David. This is the real McCoy. This guy, he understood it. He understood the business of giving. He understood it. You could, you could tell that this is coming from a place, from a depth. He said, see, whatever I've given does not mean anything. If my heart is not right, it, it does not mean anything. You try the heart. You know the uprightness of my heart. You see why he was praying those prayers in Psalms 139. Try my heart, know my thoughts. When he was already on the right path of righteousness, he knew when his heart clicks into, into motion. He knows it. He knows it because he checks himself all the time. So he could tell that he was now at the point where he could offer willingly. The Bible says, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now I have seen with joy thy people which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee as well. You see, every time we come to the church and beckoners lead us in worship, there must be a way we dance. This is one of the ways that show us that, see, we are just glad that we can be in your presence. There is a way we must dance. There is a way we must show gratitude. This sense of coming to church and you are more concerned about your clothes not getting ruffled than you are celebrating the God that kept you alive. It's pride and arrogance. Like what Hannah said. Let no pride or arrogance come out of your mouth. For God is the God of knowledge. And with him, actions are weighed. We must rabba by in his presence. Because without him, who are we? Who really are we? Who is our father? What do we have? What do we have? What do we, what do we know? He is the meaning of our lives. He is the value in it. When you see people who understand this, see, they will dance before God. Is that not what David did when he was coming back with the Ark of Covenant? And his wife saw him and said, you are a king for God's sake. Ah, I'm dancing before the king of all kings. I must never be so deluded by my position and the things that I own and the things that I have that I will come before God and I'll be respecting myself in his presence. Who cares who respects me or not? I will give all the honor to God. He is the giver of everything that I own. If I'm able to give anything, it is because I was first given of him. You must understand this with all of your heart. David understood it. This is why he was called the man after God's heart. You see God's heart, you see David. That was the man. He understood what it meant to give. When you are giving God, you give it with honor. You give him the first. You give him the best. You are not arguing on Twitter. The titles of the Old Testament. What are you saying? Do you understand what it means to be honored to give? How can you be removing yourself from honor? Just because you want to have more money in your pocket. There is a place of honor for givers. And then you say, no, ah, no, no. You're not start arguing on Twitter. God puts a place of honor for you. See, see, see the honor God blessed David with. That he could give after this manner. Imagine somebody is excluding himself from that honor because he wants to win an argument. He wants to do exegesis, mysteries. Hmm. And now I have seen with joy thy people which are present here to offer willingly unto you. See, Let's, let's go somewhere in Deuteronomy. Let, let me show you something. Deuteronomy, quickly. Deuteronomy is right after... And I've left Abacook for now. He's on sabbatical. Deuteronomy chapter 28. See, you think it's only the things you are giving to God that matters to God. I'm showing you through scripture that it is your heart that matters. Deuteronomy 28, verse 47. Look at this. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> this verse is funny. <laughs> imagine, imagine you give God something really massive, something that costs you a lot. Then you give. You say, ah, you didn't give it well. Though. Then 
he now escorts you with a curse. <laughs> now, of course, we must understand that this is before, before Christ. So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. But see what the Bible says here. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God. Which what? Ah, ah, ah. So see, it is a crime to come to church and not be joyful. It's a crime. You just come. So it's my personality. There's no personality like that. I don't, I don't laugh much. It's not, it's not my thing. Eh? It's not your thing to be joyful. <laughs> Please ask your neighbor, is it your thing? <laughs> is it your thing to be joyful? Do you know joyfulness is warfare? You can, by joyfulness, cast out devils. Just being joyful. The devil is trying to cause everything to dry up around you. The store, everything in the flock, in the vine, everything is drying up. But he said, I will rejoice. And by just rejoicing, life is flowing in the direction of all the things that concern me. Life. Because I didn't succumb to the level of my reality. Anything that I can see is subject to change. Hiya. Anything that I can see with my eyes is subject to change. That I can see that the bank account is going down, it shows that it can go up again. If I can see it, it's subject to change. I will fixate on that realm that never changes. The realm called heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where I am seated with Christ. And in that place, we only laugh when we are threatened. We only laugh. Because when God feels threatened, he doesn't feel threatened. But whenever some people gather on the earth and try to threaten him, what he responds with is laugh. Because he can't, he can't honor it by seriousness. He can't, because by the time he gets serious, he's honoring their threat. Ah, they are a real threat too. You laugh at things that are not threats, right? Because even if they start now, two eternities I give them, they can't still be worth anything that I should be worried about. So you laugh. So whenever you come into God's presence, there is a level of joy you must exude. The church of God must be the happiest place everywhere. Everywhere! You not come to church and you are just franking your face. <laughs> franking it. Bible says, but thou, because thou servest not the Lord. You see why every time the, the word giving, gifts, and all of those things appear in the New Testament, there is always a qualification for it. Whether it is cheerfully or bountifully, there's always a sense of qualification. It must be done cheerfully, delightfully. It can't just be done shabbily, casually. So the way you will give offering after I've, I'm done teaching should be very different. Because you now understand what it means to give God. He said, because you did not serve the Lord with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Look at the curses. Let's not even read it. Don't worry. <laughs> but the curses that followed this thing, and it was not because they didn't give. It was because they didn't give joyfully. It was because they didn't serve with gladness of heart. That is his own offering when you rejoice. So when we are singing, you dance. You rejoice. You swirl. You are galio. You run. You... <laughs> Amen! That's the attitude. And guess what? It can happen any time in your life. It doesn't have to be when you're in church alone. You can create an atmosphere everywhere you go. Joyfulness, gladness of heart. Because he inhabits the praises of his people. Hallelujah. So let's go back to 1 Chronicles chapter, chapter 29. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Verse 17, I know also, my God, that thou tries the heart and hast pleasure in the uprightness. And as for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these offerings. He did not get offended because he was not going to be the one to. It is God's decision. And however I can contribute to that house, I will contribute with willingness, with joy. He didn't vex that eh, it's not me, that was, which was my idea. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't get upset. He gave. O oh Lord of Abraham. Right? Isaac and of, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this. Look at this. This is the most powerful verse in all of this. He said, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their hearts unto thee. He says, let what is going on right now, let it never fizzle out of the crispness of the imagination of God's people. That is, whatever we are doing today, we must never get to a point in our lives that we begin to ascribe more value to, to ourselves than the God we are serving. We must always remember that it is God that gave us all these things in the first place. 
Because when an attitude changes, God knows. The same way actions are allowed here on earth, that is how thoughts are allowed in heaven. The moment pride enters your heart, God is the first person that gets, gets notified. He just notices it. It will show in your service. It will show in your giving. It will show in how you talk to people. It will show in how you are available. It will show the excuses you never gave before. They will just start coming up. The things you never said you were busy doing, they will just become so important. When pride enters into the heart, he says, keep this thing forever in the imagination of the heart of thy people. Let them never forget. Because attitude matters to God. We're rounding off shortly. Now, um, so powerful. So powerful. What are the kinds of gifts that can be eternalized? Remember we shared this last week um, about 1 Timothy 6. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God that gives us all things richly to enjoy, but that they should be willing to distribute, communicate, and lay up treasures for themselves. Okay? So he was trying to say there that you can convert your money, you can convert your resources, you can convert your time, your energy, and all of those things into things that cannot perish. You see, you, you, you all are looking great today, but everything you are wearing today is subject to degeneracy. Everything. From the wig, to the makeup, to the shirts, the clothes, the shoes, the bags, everything. The moment you bought it, it started nosediving in value. All right? But the, the money you used to buy those things, there is a way you can convert it. And this is the lesson in Luke 16 which we can't go into right now. It is the story of the unjust steward. But the principle that God wanted us to take from that particular parable is how that we can convert unrighteous mammon. The Bible says, make friends of the unrighteous mammon. What the friend there is talking about is use money to make eternal friends. Because he said, make friends of the unrighteous mammon so that when you fail, fail there is die when you pass away. Bible says Jesus is speaking. So you need to understand. When Jesus is speaking, you had better pay attention. Listen, there is a way you can spend your money on earth that you will go into heaven and there will be a train of people saying thank you as you are entering heaven. Jesus explained it. How many of you have ever imagined that picture before? But Jesus explained it. He said when you make yourself, or you make yourself front of the unrighteous mammon, when you fail and you enter into everlasting habitation, there is a long train of people saying thank you, thank you. Thank you for giving. Thank you for sending my children to school. Thank you for being a blessing. Thank you. There is a long train. Can we look for that verse in Luke 16? So I'll just show you quickly before we move on. So there are ways you can eternalize your gifts. Three kinds of, or three ways to eternalize your gift. And I'll share with you three gifts you can give. Three ways you can eternalize your gift. Number one, when you give unto God. Whatever you give unto God never dies. Whatever you give unto God never dies. Whatever you give unto God never dies. Number two, what you give to men for God's sake. The things you give to God directly, the things you give to men for God's sake. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 17 talks about how that he that giveth unto the poor, lendeth unto the Lord. Anytime you see someone that does not have, and then compassion wells up in your heart, and you give unto them from the bowels of your compassion, you have given unto them, but it is God that took account of that debit. So when you give unto a person, the Bible says you have lent unto the Lord. You lend unto the Lord when you give unto the poor, when you have pity unto the poor. He said, and I see unto you, make to yourself friends. He did not say use money to make friends on earth. He says, because he tells you where those friends will show up. Make to yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. That is, use your money, which is the mammon of unrighteousness. Use it to make friends. These friends will show up in your future. So that when you fail, when you die, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So, guess what? Some people, only one person will show up when they are entering heaven. Some people, there is a long train. There is a serious ceremony because they entered heaven. And it is because all the resources God gave them and blessed them with on this earth, they did not consume it on their loss. They carried it and they built institutions that could continue to channel those resources to places of need. Because if you give unto the poor, the Bible says you have lended unto the Lord. So, he said, make to yourself friends of the unrighteous mammon. So, he's not saying don't have money. Have as much money as you can, but ensure you don't trust in it. Because how we know you are trusting in it is by storing it. Do you hear what I said? When you store that thing unreasonably, you are trusting in it. Where you should store it is in a place where there is no moat, there is no burglary, no thief can come there to touch that which you have. He said you are laying up treasure for yourself. 
for another dispensation to come. Amen. He says, when you fail, because we, he didn't say if. Amen. When? Every one of us has a season, a time. We will, this is Jesus. They are written in red. When you fail, they may receive you. That is, there are people you have blessed here on earth. You thought it was just touch and go. No, they will show up in heaven. You thought you were just seeing them on the Badon Express Road. You gave them and you moved on. No, they will show up in heaven. Every of the people you have blessed with resources, you have made them a friend for another habitation, for another dispensation. It's called an everlasting habitation. So what are the three things, three ways you can eternalize your gift? Number one, you give unto God. Number two, you give unto men for God's sake. And number three, you give with love. Anytime you give with love, you are giving beyond what you are giving. You are giving because that heart, God sees the love, God sees the delight, God sees the cheerfulness, and he receives it as honor. Three things to give. Number one, let me, let me re-emphasize how to give or how to eternalize your gift. Number one, give to God, give to men for God's sake, and then give with love. Then the best kind of gifts to give. Number one, give your life. <laughs> Many of us may not want to hear this, but you give your life. This is how you eternalize. The Bible says that God had respect for Abel and then to his gifts. If he does not have respect for you because of the quality of your heart, he will not have respect for your gifts. So if he has not received you as an offering to himself, your gifts are just being wasted. What kind of a heart do you have? The Bible says, my son, give me your heart. Give me your heart. What is that part of scripture? I wrote it down here. My son, give me your heart. Proverbs 23, verse 26. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. God knows when he does not have your heart. He knows that it is money that has your heart. He knows that it is business that has your heart. When he has your heart, he knows it. So he's appealing to you. He said, my son, give me your heart. Give me your heart. Give me your heart. So the first thing to give is yourself, your life. 2 Timothy 4, from verse 6. Let's put that on the screen quickly. 2 Timothy 4 from verse 6, Paul speaking, he said, quickly, for I am now ready to be offered. Give me NIV. Look at that. This is a man that gave himself to the things of God. He gave his life. All right? For I am now ready to be poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. Next verse. This is a man who's saying that his life is poured out like a drink. He is about to be emptied. He said, for I have fought the good fight, I have finished. You see the purpose of faith? <laughs> so that you can give your life. I have fought the good fight. And we also know that that good fight is the good fight of faith. Because he also said it here. He said, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So when you live your life by faith, you must have given that life. It's not just you receive using your faith to collect, to collect. I have kept the faith. The next verse. The next verse. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. There was a certain confidence this guy had. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, is evoking the righteousness of God. He said, even God will award to me on that day. Wow. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. How I know you are, you are longing for his appearing is by how you are living your life for him now. He that hath this hope purifieth himself. There is a way you purify yourself by giving yourself to the service of God's kingdom. And that is how you wait for his coming. You don't just say it mentally, I know he's coming soon, I know he's coming soon. No, we must see it that you believe that he's coming soon by how you have given yourself to live for him. So the first thing you give is your life. You give your presence, you give your energy. So come to church is not just a nice instruction. It is an opportunity for you to give your life. Serving a local assembly, serving a church, or serving a unit, it is not just a nice thing to do after spending six months in the church. It is a matter of giving your life to a cause that is greater than you. If you really want to continue to exist beyond your death, you, have, you had better give unto a cause that is higher than just living and chilling and desiring a soft life. There is a lot more to life than what meets the eye. And so the first thing you give is your life, your presence, your energy. 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8 tells us that, how that Paul gave himself, he gave his life, he gave everything. The Bible says like a drink offering. Number two, your resources. That is your money and your goodwill. The, the relationships you've gathered over all these years, use it for the things of the kingdom. All right? Your resources, your money, your goodwill. And then lastly, 
all right, the people your life and your resources have touched, give them to. 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 2. The Bible says these things that you have heard me say among many witnesses. He said, you commit them to men who are also able to teach others. That is, we must be a people that we, we never die and that is just all God gets when, he, when we get to heaven. When we die, all right, eventually, when Jesus said when we fail, when we die, there must be people our lives touch so much that in place of us, there is a Timothy, there is, there is a Titus, there is a Philemon. That even though we are living and existing the same, there are several people that God is still harvesting from because we obeyed him. So you don't just give your life, you don't just give your resources, you give also the people that your life and your resources have touched. You influence people for God. You influence them to serve God. So that years after you are gone, there can still be a Rema Bible Training Institute that is actually traveling faster than it was when it was still alive. In death. Even though he's dead, yet he speaks. Praise the name of the Lord. And we round off with a verse that I love so much in Acts chapter 12. How that David served his generation according to the will of God. And he slept on and went up to be with his fathers. Is it Acts 12 now? Can you help me with that verse of scripture? Acts 12. Or is it Acts 13? David served his generation according to the will of God. Right? Verse 36, Acts 13. Acts 13, 36. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell unto sleep and was laid up unto his fathers and saw corruption. But we also know that David, even though he's dead, he yet speaks. Because he actually served his generation. He offered his life as a living sacrifice, as a drink offering. And that was how he was able to eternalize his legacy. And that is one thing we learn from the life and ministry of Abel. He only featured for a few lines in scripture. But we'll see how many things we have gleaned from his life and ministry. Because the little he lived for, he lived for a cause that was indeed worth the while. Father, we give you praise and we give you glory.